everyone. My name is Jack. I use he and pronouns, and I'm a third year film student at also at Emerson College. Um, I was going to say something about how Emerson College uh, isn't a gay sitcom school, despite both of us, but that's honestly a pretty good description of the culture there. Um, so, uh, anyway, a few years ago, I would have been embarrassed to talk about how I found myself in the world of film and TV criticism. This is mostly because my first attempts at writing on the subject were done on an infamous blue microblogging site called Tumblr.com, and it wasn't the kind of hard-hitting analytical research I could present at a place like this. I think you could technically call my early work peer-reviewed because Tumblr's reblog feature allows for other users to critique and extend other people's posts in a surprisingly effective way, but I don't think it's getting into any publications. For the uninitiated, Tumblr is widely considered to be the unofficial home of fandom. An overwhelming portion of its users log on to post their fan art, update followers on cosplays in progress, and theorize about the upcoming installment of their favorite series. An overwhelming portion of its users are also queer. These two things are not unrelated, and the more time I spend in the trenches of fandom, the more I begin to see it as an incredible tool for collaborative criticism. Fandom analysis of media, especially television, exists as its own ecosystem of writing conventions, vocabulary, and visual signifiers. And the thing that is so captivating about this ecosystem is that its central purpose is to analyze queer subtext, something that, in the eyes of most viewers of most shows, doesn't exist at all. It's hard to find queerness in media, even harder to find good portrayals of queerness. To the untrained eye, fandom seems to find it in nothing, to pull it out of nowhere. Fans have earned themselves a bad reputation online as the girls who cried gay people. Their work is dismissed as a fruitless endeavor, as wishful thinking, or as over-sexualized fluff. But as someone who has spent a lot of time doing the kind of analysis that fandom allows, and a lot of time analyzing that analysis, I can confidently say that the girls who cry gay people are onto something. Jose Esteban Munoz proposes in his book Cruising Utopia that queerness is not a static or individual marker of identity, but rather an action that queer people can take together. This action, whatever it is, gives its actors a glimpse of an imagined post-revolutionary, post-heteronormativity, post-gender future, always existing on the horizon. Munoz calls this action queer gesture, and while he uses it in reference to physical gestures like drag or voguing, I've been applying it to fandom. When a significant portion of a show's audience decides in unison that a, group of, that a character is trans, does that not help us imagine a queer future? When a group of gay people meet in a Discord server to pick apart every frame of a Star Trek episode, is that not queer gesture? In response to an overwhelmingly heteronormative media landscape and an increasingly inaccessible academia, fandom has created an analytical space outside of both. To quote Elizabeth Schneider, as they are often excluded from the process of mass media, members of marginalized groups frequently draw on alternative democratized means of cultural production. Such productions bear within them the potential to transgress and even subvert dominant norms, although such potential is not always realized. Fan art, essentially an act of creatively reworking, representing, and continuing an already existing text, is a prominent form of alternative cultural production. When it came time to choosing a particular fandom to serve as a case study for my work, MASH doesn't seem like the obvious first choice. It came out 50 years ago, and despite its political commentary, it holds a solid position in America's subconscious as one of the wise-cracking, woman-hating sitcoms of TV's days of yore. But in the summer of 2020, the show was given a second wind by young queer Tumblr users who watched the show over early quarantine and immediately began a collective close reading. It was a bit of an analytical frenzy and it's since been dubbed Hot Mash Summer by its participants. The online mash fandom as it exists now was a perfect subject for me. It's relatively new and relatively small. Its source material exists in completion, which means that the analytical landscape wouldn't be drastically altered by new information about characters or plot. Most importantly, the primary form of content on MASH Tumblr isn't a transformative work like fanfiction or art, but rather analytical work, short essays about characters or plot devices known on the internet as meta posts. Following tradition, the vast majority of these posts are about the implied queerness of MASH's main cast. Unintentionally, I'm sure, the structure of the show actually seems to invite this analysis and encourage viewers to read between the lines of gender and sexuality as they exist in the 4077 Army Hospital. Something that I've noticed is often forgotten by those who grew up with it is that M.A.S.H. is only a sitcom in length and laugh track. What it honestly is, is a predecessor to the irreverent half-hour dramas that we see so many of today. It walked so that the flea bags and Bojack Horsemen's of modern TV could run. A lot of its comedy was added at the behest of producers. It's a well-known fact within the M.A.S.H. fandom that none of the writers wanted a laugh track, but were forced to air it with one. When you go in with that knowledge, you start to question the intent behind every joke. Was that really supposed to be funny? Should I really be laughing? And when you combine that attitude with the baseline of homophobia,
homophobia imbued in 70s humor, you get a piece of media primed for queer analysis. I do a much better job at elaborating on this in my paper than I ever could in speech, so I'm going to read to you now from the section of my paper entitled Queer Rereading. Munoz speaks in cruising utopia of intermedia endeavors that take place exclusively within queer circles. Ray Johnson's co-respondence school, for example, was a series of letters sent out to members of his community containing collages or photographs or ticket stubs. It existed completely outside heteronormative ways of consuming art until its introduction to the Whitney Museum. Queer analysis frequently exists outside heteronormative ways of interacting with media. It takes advantage of its invisibility within the greater sphere of media analysis and uses it to comment upon and subvert the invisibility of queer people in media. Queering media is an act that takes place in a collective space so structurally separate from other forms of analysis that it becomes a space absent of them, a sort of eye in the hurricane of heteronormativity. As Munoz puts it, quote, queer cultural production is both an acknowledgement of the lack that is endemic to any heteronormative reading of the world and a building, a world making in the face of that fact, end quote. Furthermore, queer reading of media happens most frequently in open forums, in comment sections and chat servers or via the reblog feature on Tumblr, which allows audience editions and critiques a wider reach than traditional comment sections. Because of the collective nature of online analysis, seeking out queerness where none that was intended becomes an act of both resistance and community. How then is this eye of the hurricane, this space for alternative analyses, built? In many cases, especially Nash's, it is created through the subversion of the media's humor. Queerness is often the brunt of the joke in mainstream media. Where serious signifiers are present, they are intentionally hidden behind a layer of performative heterosexuality and innuendo. Subtext is allowed to become text only as a joke. Rewriting, then, is the process of reading these jokes as genuine glimpses into the true nature of a character, rather than a heterosexual punching down at queerness. This is funny because it's true, not this is funny because it could never happen. It reframes the distinction between the literal and figurative dimensions of language at work in the show's script. Hawkeye Pierce, the main character of MASH, was not supposed to be a bisexual man, but within certain readings he can be one. This means that he has the potential to be one in any interpretation. To acknowledge this potentiality is to create an ontology, and this creation is queer gesture. It follows Zizek's paraphrasing of Lacan's argument against demasking. Quote, we find then the paradox of a being which can reproduce itself only insofar as it is misrecognized and overlooked. The moment we see it as it really is, this being dissolves itself into nothingness, or more precisely, it changes into another kind of reality. We can see why Lacan, in his seminar on the ethic of psychoanalysis, distances himself from the liberating gesture of saying finally that the emperor has no clothes. The point is, as Lacan puts it, that the emperor is naked only beneath his clothes. So if there is an unmasking gesture of psychoanalysis, it is closer to Alphonse Elias's well-known joke quoted by Lacan. Somebody points at a woman and utters a horrified cry, look at her, what a shame, under her clothes she is totally naked. Here we see the suggestion that the existence of queer jokes begets the existence of queer subtext, which begets the knowledge that a character is or can be queer. Just as the Lacanian emperor is naked only beneath his clothes, the relationship between, say, Hawkeye and his friend, B.J. Honeycutt, is subtextual only beneath its concrete text, as if to say, look at them, what a shame. Under all of the jokes, they are completely serious. This concept of latent queerness, which is only visible through homophobic jokes and stereotypes, but has the potential to be turned into something applicable to a queer audience, lends itself well to Alenka Zupanchik's theory of the comedic other, capital O. Working within the idea that comedy is based primarily on misinterpretation, she posits that the other is the inevitable sorting out, the denouement, which, quote, is suspended. It floats somewhere above the scene without being able to exercise its influence on it. It remains just close enough for the whole thing not to fall apart into something utterly absurd, yet is left without the capacity to intervene, end quote. In a Shakespearean scenario of mistaken identity, the comedy comes from the fact that the audience knows about the twins or disguises, but the other characters don't. We laugh because we know the people on stage have the wrong idea, and because we are secure in the notion that eventually everything will be made clear. Queering a comedy like M.A.S.H. is a matter of remaking the other, of redefining what mistake the characters are making in regards to identity. Heteronormative analysis would assume the misunderstanding is a character's false performance of queerness. When, for instance, Hawkeye Pierce propositions a visiting general with sex, the mainstream interpretation would say that the proposition is the joke, and that the other of his heterosexuality, his rampant womanizing, is suspended directly above him, ready to descend as soon as the laughter has died down. When the same scene is analyzed as queer gesture, the humor comes from Hawkeye presenting his proposition as a joke, when the real other of his queerness is uh, a spectral presence above the interaction. That's my paper. Um, 
my work goes on to examine this comedic misrecognition in certain moments within the show. Specifically, there is an episode in season two called Carry On Hawkeye, where Hawkeye and the show's female lead, Margaret Houlihan, are left in control of the hospital. As a running bit throughout the episode, they take on the stereotypical role of a straight 1950s couple, but with Hawkeye as the housewife and Margaret as the beleaguered breadwinner. This is my personal favorite example of the way the humor can be restructured within MASH. When the episode was released, audiences were meant to laugh at Margaret's masculinity and Hawkeye's effeminacy. During Hot MASH Summer, fans saw the joke as a glimpse Fans saw the joke as a glimpse into their true natures. With the other characters gone, Hawk and Margaret could freely engage in the gender nonconformity they were always trying to perform. I also go into more detail on the way moments like this are talked about in online spaces. While I was writing this paper, I would actually restructure a lot of my points to fit the grammar and vocabulary of fandom and cross-post them on my own Tumblr account. This was mostly because I was just really excited to be talking about my favorite show, but it ended up highlighting a lot of the differences between academic and queer analysis for me. Meta posts on Tumblr use a lot of stream of consciousness because they are trying to take you on the same thought journey that the author took to arrive at a given conclusion. Fandom analysis is also a lot more likely to be inter or transmediary, drawing quotes and images from other pieces of media to insinuate a common theme between them in a process recently dubbed web weaving. The biggest difference between my writing in academia and online, though, is that my work in fandom is being written to other queer people. When I write media studies work, there is an implicit demand to define queerness or facets of media queer coding in a way that is digestible for a heteronormative capital A academy. When I write for fans, we can skip the definitions and go straight to what matters. And what matters in queer analysis, above everything else, is the love story. The act of fandom, the act of queer media consumption, is at its heart an act of creating a love story where that was intended. Sometimes it is an act of creating a love story where it has been actively avoided or unwritten. Fandom says that even in the middle of a war zone, buried under layers of 1970s homophobia, there is a love story, and it is a story we will find together. Thank you.